Well, welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady, and today's guest is Dr. Claire Nelson. She's the author of her new book called Smart Futures for a Flourishing World, a Paradigm Shift for Achieving Global Sustainability. Claire, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sean Grady. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. So, Claire, you've got a um, you've been in the the uh, I guess uh, you you've been in the business doing sustainability for quite a while. Let's talk a little bit about your journey so far, and then we'll dive into this book. Give us a little background about your experience and what you've been doing this you know in your career. When I think back on my career, I would say probably my first foray into sustainability, we didn't call it that back then, was when I was doing my master's thesis in energy modeling. It was the era of the great energy crisis. Remember back then? Yeah, I'm back in 78. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I was at Purdue doing industrial engineering and I decided to do an energy model, you know, modeling and you know, simulation modeling was hot. It was just the thing of the time. Yeah. So I decided to do, what was it? A multi-objective goal programming model of um, <laughs> to do energy planning and I did a case study of Jamaica. Uh, I think my second big foray into it was when I started working, I was doing a doctorate at the time and I decided to look at the question of technology assessment because I was concerned how many white elephants were being invested in, in developing countries. Mm. And at the time, the World Bank and organizations of such had not yet put in place environmental safeguards. So my dissertation research was called a systems approach to uh, to whole systems technology assessment. And I created like a framework for looking at um, impact of a technology and environment, social impact, um, life cycle impact, intellectual property impact, a whole lot of impact, which I thought from an engineering perspective would make less white elephants come out of the, um, you know, out of our investments in countries of what is hospitals, schools, roads, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think that I was a pioneer. <laughs> I'd say you were a pioneer. You were like the OG of the sustainability back in the day, right? <laughs> back come, in on. The day. come on. Come on, yeah. I started using the phrase sustainability engineer probably around 10, 11 years ago. Uh-huh. Because although I have an industrial engineering degree, I've never really worked in a regular manufacturing industry. I've always worked in economic development planning. Right. And I used those skill sets to treat whatever challenge I was looking at, looking at it from a whole systems framework of design. So, um, so I would think that I hope that when I've looked at the problems I've tried to design for, I hope that I've looked at sustainability using the lens of my doctorate as what, how, how is this going to impact on the the social, environmental, and political space in which this new technology or project program plan, whatever is being embedded. Yeah, no, that's good. That's really good. Well, okay, so tell us a little bit about the book that you wrote, and you know why? Why did you write it? And then, more importantly, I mean, you've used some creative storytelling to get your message across to the reader a little bit. So let's let's talk about these these three uh, futures that you kind of. You weave into the conversation, so for the listeners. Well, help me remember. So the first thing is, why did I write the book? Well, I wrote a book because <laughs> I've been, I kind of self-appointed myself as a SDG evangelist. Mm -hmm. I was there where the Millennium Development Goals was a founded. I was still working in the belly of the beast in Washington, so to speak. And I was very annoyed because I thought... Um, they were not successful. They were successful in terms of it did allow the agencies to at least have a shared goal. So that was a major success. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. it was. That was a big shift from how we work before this kind of haphazard who does what and then each country does something. So you wasn't you weren't seeing sort of a cohesive move forward towards the future. So when the SDGs were thought about long before they were formed, I started really thinking about what would we do differently. And by this time, I had um, developed an interest in foresight, strategic foresight, oh, a okay. tool for development planning. Right. My argument for that was that we were doing a lot of investments based on planning 
on the past and extrapolate extrapolate in the past into the future which mm -hmm. when you think about it especially because we are now doing policy-based lending so you're doing an environmental sector loan or education sector loan or a healthcare sector loan you can't just simply say well we had 55 patients last year we're going to have 55 patients plus 10 percent because the population is going by 10 percent that's not how it works in terms of reality mm -hmm. of course i might add when I started to try to do foresight in development at my institution, most people look at me as if I had grown two horns. That's the <laughs> You're like, what planet are you from, Claire? <laughs> Although I'm sure you were like, you'd be like best buddies with Bart Eads right now, probably, right? <laughs> I was not. I was not exactly a favorite person. Um, I must say, however, that my manager did give me some 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 leeway. But the fun about it for me was when when he I brought in some what I call a well-established futurist to talk about you know how they could use foresight in their work and he said man just well let's see if they bite because he really liked the idea but he didn't want to impose it on them right uh, well, I, I must say he was extremely an ex extremely bright guy he was and so so most of them said even those who were doing education sector lending was like oh I don't see the value of this for what we're doing or one said we don't have don't have a mandate i'm like okay i know it's only because it's i who am saying it why you're not listening but that's okay i got what i wanted out of it which is at least to get the idea on the table in the air so mm -hmm. i find it fascinating now that the undp is all about telling countries you must do strategic force that i'm like i said this back in the day <laughs> and nobody listened again the original the original <laughs> So um, that's why I, I decided to write this book, because I do think um, the SDGs has to go beyond even, I mean, they're doing a much better job than the MDGs in terms of trying to popularize it, trying to include more mm -hmm. people. But I think it's still much the space of the policy wonks, if you will, the development wonks. And so when I speak to my friends, family members who have no, no interest in it, they what do you do? It's, what is that? You know what I mean? So, yeah. So the first thing, even in creating the name of the title, it was supposed to be Sustainable Development Goals. And I did a poll of some of my friends and I said, what is that? So I'm like, okay. Sustainability, they understood without knowing the goals. So let me just say sustainability in the title so that mm -hmm. we don't only focus on trying to reach the already converted to thinking about the goals, but that we can convert some people who are not necessarily interested in the UN numbers, but they are interested in being a part of the social movement because they have been awoken to the reality that we can't continue as we have been. So yeah, that's true. You're absolutely right. I mean, with COVID happening and uh, the world shutting down and the realization that, um, you know, climate change is a real situation now, more so uh, evident than ever. Uh, yeah, ever it's at the top of mind of most social, uh, you know, people in, the, in, in you know, the world today. So... Well, but That's those who are conscious, I should say, um, those who are not consciously aware, maybe subconsciously aware, depending on where they sit on the poverty scale. Uh -huh. So that if you're extreme poor and you're constantly having to, you know, replant or losing your crops, you may not, you may not have the sophisticated language for it, but you certainly know that you know your farm isn't doing as well as it is or your fish aren't doing as well as it is so you're aware that something is happening that's making it harder for you to make right. up the living at the margins on the margins mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well okay so you know you, you've had that background with uh you know wanting to to really kind of be evangelist of you know sustainability and sdgs and things like that so Talk about this this idea of writing the book and weaving these stories to bring out the message. <laughs> so what happened was um, when I got the call from um, Tim Ward, who um, is the publisher of the series Resetting Our Futures, he said, um, somebody told me you may have a book in you. I'm like, well, I don't know about that. He says, like, really? You, I said, well, what do you do? I told him what I was doing. He said, it sounds like a book to me. Because I've been talking about the smart futures for some time. Why? Because I just got so irritated about all this hoopla about, oh, we're going to have smart autonomous cars and we're going to have smart refrigerators going to tell you when you need milk. <laughs> you're going to have you know, smart houses. I'm like, wait a minute, what am I left for us to do? We're the only dummies trying to out outsource all of what we do to machines. <laughs> 
slowly can sit around and do nothing, right? And then we talk about smart cities, and I'm like, really? The smart city is really about, okay, we're going to have electric lights, and we're going to have to collect better taxes and collect, you know, make sure you can get, don't be speeding if you can't spot the camera, you're going to get tickets in the mail, you didn't know you were. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of mad and I do my best thinking if I'm irritated, quite frankly. Yeah. So I, I was like, we're the only if just to talk about smart everything and we're the, and where is that even about? We need to talk about smart futures. And that slogan popped in my head. So when Tim Ward said, You have a book in you, I said, Well, what do you I said, I really want us to become smarter about the future. I want more people. I want 11% of people in the world, especially those who have a smartphone, to, to who are in, in, in leadership at some level of life or another, whether it's political leadership, managerial leadership, academic leadership, NGO leadership, church leadership, you know, leadership of your home, you have a smartphone, then you're more than likely connected to the world in some way. And you're more than likely to recognize that we are together one whole more connected than you believe because yeah the world's getting a lot smaller with technology exactly so i said if i can get 11 percent of these people to always ask some smart questions when they're designing a product or a policy or interrogating a rule or you know they're protesting something but they don't have the language for it if I can get them to ask five smart questions, we can design our way out of the sinking hole that we have kind of slipped into. Because we're kind of in a sinking hole trying to scramble out, right? Mm -hmm. And so many times you have a technical design solution, but the political will and the social space isn't there for that technical solution to emerge, to be invested in, and then to flourish. And so you need more people consciously able to speak the same language and hence the need for this framework, the Smart Futures framework, as well as the idea that doing it in such a way that we bring the stakeholders together, then you need a narrative. That's where the that's where the little future tell storytelling comes in, because you're yeah. trying to work on the emotional heartstrings of the reader in a way that they understand the analogy through these stories. Exactly. Not only that, if I am saying that we do better design around water resources, if in the meeting you don't just have the experts on hydrology and sanitation and engineering, but you actually have you know the people who are using water for manufacturing or a couple of people who represent you know condominiums or a couple of people who represent academia, you have a couple of people who represent people who you know can barely pay a water bill. If you have a couple of people on the table, you may have a better overall design to achieving the SDG on water for whatever country or city or town or county you're doing this research or this proposal or this planning for. Mm -hmm. But typically what happens, you will have an engineer that only knows how to speak to engineers or <laughs> you have an economist who only knows how to speak to economists and therefore never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. If we want to achieve a future and the design the most efficient way, it's best to design together. It might take a little bit more time on the front end, but you save time on the back end, right? So mm -hmm. design together means that when you get people into the room and you're using a foresight approach, you're starting with some anticipatory stories, some anticipated narratives that elicit what people want and try to find a shared language, a common language for this vision that the solution you're trying to design is going to create. What does the world look like? What does your town look like? What does your a community look like if you have achieved success? And a story is the best form of accomplishing that. And that's part of that strategic foresight, you know, exercise too. creating that, uh, you know, that what if or that, you know, what what desired outcome do I want to achieve? Right. Like you mentioned. So, uh, yeah, that's part of it. And, and using that stories to get you there. That's great. I love that. Um, well, OK, so what are the challenges we are faced with now? And, how, you know, how do we get here? Well, when you think, well. So it was funny because I thought nobody's going to think these um, 
five questions can solve anything because they don't all they always think it has to be hard right <laughs> it's, it's it's complex but it doesn't have to be hard it's two different things it's complex because everything is everything as the rest of her used to say in jamaica it's mm -hmm. all connected but we have been taught and we have been trained in disciplines that don't always speak to each other so even within the engineering discipline we don't have a common language for deciding what the sustainability literacy looks like. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to create a global working group to do just that so that we can have, you know, chemical engineers saying for us, it has to have these five things for civil, it has to have these five things. Okay. So if you're a freshman doing engineering, right, what are you going to understand about sustainability before you go into your particular profession? Field? Yeah. Exactly. And so this idea of trying to cultivate a language because of these challenges is really critical to the construct that drove me. So I thought about things like, okay, why do we make certain decisions? Well, the economists normally say this is the way it has to be. It's very rare that, that, uh, that uh, a county, a government, a country says, okay, engineers, design what you want and we'll build it. No, the economists typically say, well, we have a budget of $5 million, go and design a road that matches that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, and if you come back with something that's more than that, they're going to cut it. And even if you try to change it, they don't always see why that difference in the long run is going to save, you know, again, time and money. So there's a challenge mm -hmm. of the metrics. We don't have metrics that really measure what matters. Mm -hmm. What brought us here also, from my perspective, in a bigger, bigger issue of the environmental thing we're talking about is my pet peeve about this construct that uh, we sort of own the, the nature. We own nature. And so we can quantify it. We can chop off mountains. We can dig up hills. And so we have just laid waste to bauxite and coal and iron and all these things, which I'm not going to complain about because clearly we needed to things that we're doing. But we have done so in a way that did not really measure also the damage correctly. Yeah, the, the impact, right? Right. So we really have favored misuse or ill use of our resources. And this is why we're at this space. So I begin with saying, OK, our Judeo Christian based capitalist monetary system globally, because that's what's driving the world, right. has got to do like a personality check. Right. Uh -huh. I preached that one Sunday in church and people were like, I don't know if they were happy or not because they couldn't tell if they were really getting it. <laughs> I wanted to test it out on a friendly audience. So I did it in my home church. My goal is to get <laughs> many churches to do this gospel <laughs> about declare about environmental uh, covenant. What kind of covenant do we need, first of all, as, uh, as spiritual beings having a material existence? What kind of covenant do we need as social beings understanding that we can't, no, it's no longer cute to think about exporting waste to some poor country that you know can afford a way so we can live in clean pristine nation that's not cool anymore because guess what the waste in that country goes to the sea and then the sea comes right back to us anyway so it's yeah not, it's everything not, is everything right there right everything is everything <laughs> <laughs> Right. And then we have all these other challenges around natural resources. Take, for example, the coal tan that's in our phone. I mean, the, the places where coal tan is mined. I mean, they're environmental disasters. Right. Mm -hmm. And so those poor people in, you know, um, the Congo or wherever others poor country these things are, they don't have any power to demand stuff of the government. You know, so how do we who use the phones put in place? some support for these um, fledgling environmental movements in these countries to have a little bit of comfort so they can have support when they try to show backbone before they're invariably killed by somebody or some new war is started, which gets rid of these people who are trying to create an issue. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many ways in which I think the challenges around natural resource use or ill use, um, climate change enablers, quote unquote, so people who refuse to see that, listen, just it's not that hard if you're funded to find a carbon capture system, as opposed to funding my pet peeve, and I'm sure they're going to probably hear this interview, my pet peeve is an idea to 
move green sand from Hawaii to the Caribbean to test if green sand can absorb more carbon than white sand. And I have a fundamental problem with geoengineering, for example, because typically in the decision making, there's nobody from the community that's at the design table. They're not right. the they're normally brought on after the design is done to say, well, you were going to do this design in your test this pilot in your area, and we want you to kind of observe and see Tell what us. happens. Yeah. I don't like that. So we need to have a different conversation around geoengineering on the earth. And as we move into space, certainly that means down these ideas like, oh, let's just you know use nuclear stuff to kind of terraform Mars so we, we can have a place for humans to live because we're all going to Earth. Are we really all going to Earth if we were to change our metrics to be more morally meaningful? Are we really out going to Earth were to change the way we grow food, the way we distribute food, the way we save food from being wasted, the way we treat our soils, the way we treat our uh, fertilizer systems and all the other systems we have. Are we really, have we really outgrown the earth, especially given that the birth rate in many countries is declining? Uh-huh, right, yeah. And once we finish creating all these robots to replace us, this is what I don't really understand. <laughs> the smart, right? smart people. What are we going to do? <laughs> My mother used to tell me the devil find works for idle hands. Idle humans is not a good idea. Not a good mm-hmm. idea. We have to have things to do. Yeah. Because because not everybody is born with a natural tendency to have a poet waiting for the opportunity to sit home and write poetry or write music or craft the most delightful um, knitted caftans, right? There's yeah. some people who really find purpose, whose soul blooms in the society in which they work and they find identity and comfort and community in that. So before we go off and talk about oh people were released to do what there was this really meaningful work but we we say that to kind of comfort ourselves but there's no plan no plan well yeah this. yeah so so what what do you think is driving this whole uh change to create a more sustainable future now that you know we've woken up in society what's really behind it is it just the climate change you know um you know no i think a few issue- of us I think a few of us, by a few of us, I mean, maybe there's about 15 million of us or so in the world who kind of realize whether or not we are environmentalists or economists or teachers from different walks of life. We Uh realize that "Mm, this is not sustainable. It's not going to work. I can see my grandchildren having a hard time Uh um, with water. I can see how they're not going to have a good life because, you know, it's just the society certain kind of social capital and social cohesion is being uh, destroyed look at what's happening in america right now it's like we're civil civility in politics. Yeah. oh yeah. we know i mean so here it is we thought it's, it's crazy at the end of the cold war we will we will also have a cold war in america in right. america we have a cold war so how do people of different opinions find room for a seat at the table to share a coffee and agree to hear each other out, agree to hear where we're coming from. I have to say, as somebody who did not consider myself an environmentalist, certainly in my 30s, I must have become a tree hugger recently (laughs) because all of a sudden, I think one day I was reading about the whales being beached. And I was just weeping unconsolably. It was just the whale. I, I, mind you, I've never seen a whale in real life, right? <laughs> just the thought of these majestic animals being beached. Right. Affected because, they, because they're being affected by climate change, right? Not, not just climate change. They're also being affected by underwater naval nuclear bombs. Oh, well, yeah, there's that. And then also just over harvesting the fish in the sea, right? And just causing damage there too, right? A lot of things are affecting. So I found that that I was so pained by that. I started paying attention to the sea. I'm Mm -hmm. from an island. I'm from Jamaica. And I realized that, my God, most Jamaicans don't care about the sea. And the sea could die one day because we already have coral bleaching and those things. So that's kind of how I became an environmentalist, quote unquote. Mm. 
over time, even though I wouldn't consider myself a practicing one. But I am an advocate for us really thinking about what we're doing to the earth. And I love your title, this regenesis, if you will, of us as now co-creators, now that we can clone sheep and you know, splice the gene to create new species. We have to see ourselves in a true sense as being stewards, right? Stewards of the earth, caretakers. Yeah. Not the way we have done in the past where we take, but we don't care, right? Right. But caretakers where we take care of the bounty that is in the earth that's available for us to use. Well, and, and so that's how the, you know, the 17 sustainable development goals are being brought in. There's 169 targets uh, that are, you know, they're supposed to be good, you know, measures, indicators of, you know, measuring the progress. And that's a lot of tracking of various things to, uh, you know, monitor the progress. But, you know, we're trying to do that to meet these climate change temperature reductions to become more sustainable. I mean, how are we going to implement all these and do that well again unfortunately even though it's nice in theory and for people who are the ones it's not really accessible to the average person right and not many cities have been able to bring it down to the local level which you really need to do we need to have like dashboards that are understandable and this is why my framework the s stands for sustainable systems the m stands for meaningful metrics a metric of 20% reduction in energy so on, so is not meaningful to the average person on the street. Okay, we don't care. We just want cheap gas to move our car. I say this as somebody who still drives a gas in car, even though I think about buying an electric car, because I'm thinking, well, my brother-in-law don't know how to fix an electric car, so if I buy a car, I'm going to spend more money to get into the mechanic because he doesn't know how to fix it. Okay. I <laughs> Okay, I'm just being honest, okay? Yeah, right. Oh, I do not drive an electric car. I have looked at what's happening in India. India has invested in trying to do solar, solar energy charge cars. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait for this to hit the market. And I said, I'm not going to buy one. That's the question. Well, I think, I think we'll get there as the market kind of, you know, makes it affordable too, right? You know, there is a bit of the capitalistic sort of market trend, you know, market, uh, you know, uh, pressures to m move this way. And, and I think we're seeing a lot of companies in, you know, that are operating now are really pushing for uh, these uh, zero net carbon emissions, these these green, sustainable, more, pra you know, uh, practices. Uh, you know, some of the oil and gas companies are now becoming more energy companies and they're looking at alternative ways to generate that energy, like through renewable natural gas or, you know, solar instead of the petroleum process that emits, you know, lots of carbon emissions. So I think there is a, a big shift in society. And over time, we're going to get there where I think electric cars and things are, are just the common way of purchasing products for vehicles. But there's also, uh, I think um, there is a little bit of some, in, I think, regulatory pressure, policy pressure that's going to help expedite that, uh, you know, if, if some of these policymakers have their way with it. But I really feel like the market naturally will probably get there sooner rather than later. Well, the question is, it really does need to get there sooner rather than later, because for islands and coastal zone communities, which are going to bear the brunt of the sea level rise, mm -hmm. um, I think some of the mothers are suggesting that by 2035, some people are going to have to start moving. Mm -hmm. uh, has anybody talked about where those people are going to move to? Are their communities welcoming these people? Are playing out a pilot to see what it look like or assimilation? Or a game or well, a if it's in the U.S., the, they better get their immigration policies fixed by then. I mean, they got 20, 15 years to figure it out. <laughs> but, you know, but you know what? I would say that um, the American islands have now formed an organization. It's called Climate Strong Islands. And they're uh -huh. islands come on board and they're creating partnerships with other islands around the world. Great. Hawaii very much a leader in this space. Hawaii has a dashboard system that is really, um, I would say, enviable. I'm trying to figure out how to bring it something to Maryland where I live. Uh -huh. um, 
coming up with some kind of, well, how would I get them to do it? You know, <laughs> And then clearly as, as somebody who's folks in the Caribbean region, I also want to see the Caribbean look at what Hawaii is doing to break, make the dashboard of data collection more accessible to leaders, which are not necessarily involved in this big national planning. So in Hawaii, business leaders, community leaders are very much a part of the process. And so they're moving more rapidly towards this emissions um, Cut down into because the policies are easier to move, it's easier to get people to vote because people understand what it is we're trying to do. So I think we have to certainly work harder at doing this trans community, transdisciplinary community building so that we can get the, the, the tipping point number of people who can vote in the kind of policies and policy makers that are critical for us to have sustainable future. That, that, that to me is one of the critical things we have to do. Yeah, okay. Well, so, you know, we, we, we've got the 17 sustainability goals. Um, you know, it is a bit of still kind of new terminology for most people in society. They're not really up to speed. If you're in the environmental business, you, you're very aware of it. Most companies are starting to become lots more familiar with them. Uh, especially if they're global national companies where they're in other countries. and But, you know, how has the COVID-demic, as you say in your book, affected the implementation, <laughs> the implementation of SDGs? Oh, my God. I feel so distressed. Well, in some ways, well, it certainly has enabled more rapid uptake of a digital mindset, which is good because some countries were saying, oh, we cannot send people to, we cannot do this and we cannot do that, but they were forced to do that. So that right. is a good thing. Many developing countries were forced to think about how we're going to teach students if they can't go to school. It's true that some children could make it to school because they just live outside of the, you know, the access Classroom. of uh, of us uh, also have access to internet, right? Uh -huh. Internet is still not affordable universally. But for those students who lived in urban areas, some governments actually, you know, created mobile um systems so that the kids could go to one area and sit with their parents' phone most times, not no laptop. And some countries were able to get funding to buy laptops for their students. And of course, many people in the diaspora, African diaspora, Caribbean diaspora, were engaged in doing fundraising to send laptops home to their primary school or laptops home to their high school so that the kids would not be left behind. So I think that's one positive outcome I want to flag. However, because we have to go now go back to the one-time non-reusable stuff, we have a whole bunch of plastic. <laughs> that yeah, we, we do. That's a big problem. And unfortunately, many of the plastic is not being done with um, biodegradable plastic um, because the biodegradable plastic is still fairly new and they were not set up for rapid like changeover. Mm -hmm. So what I do hope to see is the biodegradable plastic people trying to find a way to scale up what they're doing so we can move a lot of these masks and other systems over to um, biodegradable systems, given the major advances that have happened in nanotechnology and materials engineering, making them still able to withstand, um, you know, ba bacteria or virus or whatever, but at the same time being bi biodegradable. And I'm sure some very clever people right now are working on those seven syllable methyl, syllables, whatever, whatever systems. <laughs> I love right. those you know, with the seven-sided figures and then all the carbon molecules going off of that. <laughs> uh, I never did pass. I did pass chemistry, but I never did understand it half of the time. I'm a physics person myself. But the point is, the material science people are working hard, I think, to do something about it. So I, would, I think that despite what many people are saying, oh, we're not going to, like somebody wrote somewhere, we're not going to achieve the goals till 2080 something. I'm like, is this person crazy? Why would you even say that? 28 is something we'll be dead. We'll be told. Yeah, right? right. So right. it's not that we're not going to achieve the goals by 2030. We have to ask a different question. How can we ensure that the delay in achieving the goals is not more than five years? Right? And therefore, it means that we have to change the systems. We have to have more action-oriented labs 
more collaborators. And that's why my book calls for the establishment of global collaborators that can test out new ways of designing systems, new ways of sharing information so we can get to better globally viable solutions faster. Well, so so who are some of the voices driving, you know, society to these sustainable changes to achieve these smart future? Like, you know, in the book, you mentioned there's a bunch of tribes, you yeah. know, that are that are kind of, you know, leading or, or influencing, you know, the, the narrative here. So talk about that a bit, if you could. Right. So I decided to use the term tribes because of how separate we tend to be. So when you think of yourself as a person. The average person probably belongs to maybe four or five tribes, right? Because there is a tribe of your family. There's a tribe sometimes of your faith, faith community, if you are a member of a faith community. There's a tribe of the college you went to, right? And then loyalty, right? Definitely sports fans are like tribes. Never, yeah. never They will like slaughter each other over one goal, right? Then we have uh, tribes in terms of the sector. So you have um, the merchant tribe, which are people who are in the business of making money, and that's their primary goal. You have what I call the caretaker tribe, which are the NGO community, civil society, that try to kind of want to do good for most people, right? Uh, then you have the education tribe. I call those the mentors that are trying to educate and support the next generation of people and leaders. And we have the um, the, the the elected officials or the leader tribe, which elected officials who are, whose job it is supposedly to take care of government and governance. <laughs> and so each of them have a different way of seeing the world. And unfortunately, most times they don't always speak to each other. However, I have to say with the SDGs, I have seen where many big companies global companies have signed the social compact right for the sdgs yep. we see where many universities around the world especially the bigger ones have signed on to a different uh charters or principles of practice that they hope to um imbue on their campuses so that they can also drive sustainability in their campuses and impact on the surrounding because some universities depending on how large they are actually drive the economy of a town so they really do have influence over you know social change and so that's very exciting so between academia private sector and civil society all of which i'm kind of calling the plural sector to some extent um i think Oh, and of course, media. How could I forget media? No, media is yeah. kind of iffy body. I don't know if media has actually signed on in any serious way to support the goals. I don't think so. I think there's a couple of people, but I put them in there because I think one of the things I would like to see happen, I would like to see the entertainment community in particular do a better job of you know, funding films and entertaining movies and games that truly entertain by educating us about how can we solve these problems? I mean, yeah. gamification is hot, right? You know that. But it's still mostly, you know, some shoot up or if it's a gamification, it's, it's boring and it's obviously you're trying to teach us something, but we don't really want to learn. So the average person don't really want to learn. I mean, me, even me, I read trash. When I'm not reading a textbook, I don't want to read any intelligent book, okay? I want to read like, you know, <laughs> Harley Quinn or man. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want the you want the you know the magazine or you know some other something quick and easy you don't have to you know yeah spend too much time focusing on it so when i'm reading about gamification which i try to read about i try to read something that is a fun read and not an academic read right yeah right That's i learn faster so i think if we do have a job of entertaining people while we're sneaking some knowledge we yeah can as well and so another yeah. I like story. I think stories can be made to be educational, but still entertain people and let them laugh or cry or feel something. That's very important. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of that storytelling that comes through in the book with your kind of, you know, you're sneaking it in that way, which is good. I like your little analogy there. That was that was that was that was kind of sly right there. That was nice. Um, <laughs> well, so okay. Well, how are how is the you, you in your book you talk about the weird society, you know? Uh, talk about how they're standing in the way of making changes needed to achieve sustainable goals. Well, the weird societies, I came upon this word, I think it was coined by, I don't know, some economists usually, but it's West, Western educated, industrialized, rich, developed countries, right? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and democratic. They have a lifestyle to which they have become accustomed, right? Now, um, so let's say that's Europe, Canada, the US, and maybe Australia, Japan, Korea, maybe a few others, right? But by and large, these are they. And they have a lifestyle to which they have become accustomed. And they're not going to give it up. I think the U.S. is probably the worst because our social cohesion is not as developed as the older nations, right? I mean, America is relatively young at what? Is it 400 years or something? So, so when you look at Greece, which is like thousands of years old, or Turkey, and you know, these societies have been around ever since. You know, you, you can see all the ruins, right? They're mm -hmm. the of human society. Um, so they're continuous societies almost. Uh, they have a bit more social capital sometimes, not all the time, because we still have wars, etc. over there. But in things like, I think, climate change and flooding affects them, I think there's more agreement as to what should happen. In yeah. the U.S., we're not seeing agreement as to what should happen. I said to myself, between 2018 and 2019, America experienced every single possible natural disaster. My God, it was terrifying. I was like, there was hailstorm, there was mudslides, there were floods, there were tornadoes, there were forest fires, there were, I mean, everything could happen, happened. And still, people are saying, it's a fake, it's not real. What is it going to take to have yeah. more believe that okay may not be you personally but the fact is that there are people in california who really had to move because of forest fires there are people in new york whose basements were flooded out because of flooding in new york and so long along the coast of north carolina south carolina mississippi all these places that have been ravaged by you know climate disaster weather disaster mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i wish that there were a there was a better way of helping Americans see themselves in the other who is suffering through that, that goes beyond the three seconds or three minutes of the new cycle of the day. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I think a lot of companies and, and you know, uh, municipalities, they're, they're looking at resiliency as a solution to kind of prepare and prevent and be prepared for these natural disasters instead of maybe getting it to the root of the core of the issue, which is, the climate change issues that we really have it's like if we could reduce these disasters from you know happening be with you know reduction of carbon and temperature and i think we would see all these crazy uh you know natural disasters that we have to you know, have such a resilient planning in place to to, to protect us i think that most scientists would say you will when you're not going to turn back anything what we want to do is slow down or stop the increase which is a mm. different thing so if we really have this carbon sink in the system, it's going to have to play out. I like to think sometimes of Mother Nature, and this is uh, the reason why I have the book cover with you know, the, the, the Earth on it, the Mother Nature on it, is because I wanted to um, sort of uh, talk about her as being, okay, I'm tired of you all. I'm going to kick you off. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to reset this whole thing, and we're going to redo it if you don't change your ways. Yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, let's let's keep you know that that arc that arc mythology the no yeah. mythology right that the flood mythology is in more than one myth so yes it's in the Judeo Christian mythology but it's also in you know in other mythologies as well so there obviously some truth to it that you know there was some kind of a I'm a believer in the flood I believe it happened right so I. I uh, this is an aside. So I did a sermon once on that, right? So I did a sermon on the woman in the Bible. So I was, and uh, the, the topic I was given was the, the Bible, the woman, the woman in the Bible, and society, a woman in the world. So I'm like, well, I have to talk about you know environmental movement. That's major. That's a major thing I want to do. So I couldn't find a woman in the Bible <laughs> who were in environmental movement. But I said, wait a minute. They were, we had an environmental disaster in Noah's Ark. Yeah, his wife. But ah, but nobody mentioned Noah's wife by name. So I went hunting down all oh, kind of old Jewish texts, and I found a name for her in one of these uh, obscure books. So I go, it was it was an Episcopalian church I was preaching in. So I went and I said, and I know y'all don't talk about it, but let me just tell you, I forget the name name. I don't remember it by heart, but. 
let's say her name was uh, uh, Monica. Monica, that's Noah's wife, was the one who had to, you know, find the food for all these animals that were put in. <laughs> the people fell out because they never expected that. I was, I think that a good one is laughing at this because I kind of painted this picture of her trying to say, like, no, so you want to do what? <laughs> <laughs> I have to do what? But, but, but the point is that, um, yeah, you know, we have had, we have to think about, yes, the resilient design and the book, the R in Smart Future stands for resilience that is robust in the engineering sense. So you're designing for your worst case and your worst right. case more than one time right and yeah. you're designing for the wild card that they say will probably never happen in a hundred years because you believe that more than like it is going to happen and you want to make sure that you are taking account of it so this is um this idea of resilient and resilient planning i would like to see communities really if if i had a dream that i could fulfill i would like to see um, you know, some of these comp NGOs like Pew Charitable Trust and Annie Casey Foundation really not just fund the big, you know, environmental NGOs, but fund communities, especially those that have gone through something, to mm -hmm. do sort of a smart futures community circle, mm -hmm. to talk about what they learned from the process, to be given some skills around designing solutions and which they could partner with the local university or the local, um, you know, to your college or whatever. And yeah. have these communities come together to design solutions for themselves. Well, we'll talk about how do you think we make the paradigm shift to make all these uh, changes that we need to for, you know, a smart future? Um, to make a paradigm shift for this future we want, I think the design process, getting into the mindset of these design questions, and this is why I try to make it very, very simple, because you want to have something that's portable. You want to have something that works across um, the fault lines of, um, you know, this sector, this industry, this academic field, right? And so... The idea of the Smart Futures Framework, which says, okay, here's the five questions you want to ask. Is this product process policy plan program um, contributing to a sustainable system, right? Is uh, Are we using meaningful and metrics which are, have some morality attached to them? Um, are we accounted for all the agents in the system we have on the study or to design them? Do, are we designing with their anticipation and their aspiration in mind? And are we designing so that they have be able to be adaptable in that framework because if they're not able to adapt, then they're going to resist and then everything will fall down. The R is about the resilience and the T is about transformative use of technology. And so my hope is that um, if we're able to get, you know, some funding through, and my the book is asked, like we're looking to see, can we get support to work with cities that already are talking about the SDGs or communities who know they have a problem but don't know where to start, where we could create these circles of change with, as I said, working with the local colleges, local NGOs. And basically it's something they can almost teach themselves. It's not like it's brain science or rocket science. You don't need a degree in anything to use these five questions. What you need to be able to do is bring enough people to the table that have opposing viewpoints so that your design takes into, key, into, in, in, into consideration those opposing viewpoints from day one. Because if you try to design around those people, it will not work. Yeah, no, that's good. That's true. I, I, I got you. I mean, I agree. Um, well, you know, and I should say, and I should say that I come to this theory of change um, because I once read a, a paper that was put out by some scientists at Rensselaer, and they had done a study, and they said that um, a paradigm change happens when eleven percent of a population community believe that this new idea is the right idea mm -hmm. and i put it in the math and said wait a minute so if you are you telling me for real 11 percent of a community on the study so if it's uh, people in maryland or people in a state of ohio or whatever said no we really want to move on this thing if they can get 11 percent of them to agree we may be able to change the narrative and therefore change the trajectory of the future and that's where the light bulb went off so i think 
Because we walk around with a smartphone in our hands, why pick a new idea or a new, you know, word that we have to learn? Everybody uses the word smart almost every single day. All they have to say is, I'm not, do I want to be smart about my future? If I want to be yeah. smart about my future, then I need to ask these questions. I probably need to have something called the Smart Futures app. Hmm. I didn't think about it. It's a good idea. I think I probably work on that. Work and say smart is up. Download to ask smart questions for your smart future. That's it. You know? <laughs> <Right. laughs> well, I mean, that's good. And and you're right. We we need to make decisions with a green lens or a green sustainable perspective in, in all aspects of you know our life in some form or fashion. And I know that you, you in the book you talk about not everyone's gonna be the evangelist. You know, like yourself, or not everyone's going to be, you know, have a platform like, you know, the Environmental Transformation Podcast, where we can shine a light on these types of topics. But there's going to be a lot of people who can just be part of the movement, you know, like everyone doesn't need to be a leader, right, to, to actually make this change, right? So talk about what you're, you think that looks like. I, there's what I call movementology, right? I can't miss, I, it's because everybody... You know, people like to start things because they get a high from starting something. And half the time we can't sustain it, right? Ask uh-huh. me about this because I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh-huh. sleep really nice because I'm like, why did I start this again? But I can't stop because I don't want to look foolish, right? Yeah. But I think if we recognize that, number one, you don't have to be a leader of the movement. You are equally important as a follower, as a worker, as a supporter. And if you, and even in the leader of your own household, the leader of your own life, the way you show up to a meeting, the way you speak up when you see something is wrong, you don't have to be in a movement to speak up in a meeting to say, hey, maybe in my, in my office we should, you know, uh, change from using styrofoam cups to, 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 to buy the paper, paper cups, for example. It might cost you a little bit more, and maybe people have to put a little bit more in the kitchen to buy cups, or maybe everybody should just bring their own cup from Bring their own cup and reuse it, right? You know. And reuse it. So I'm saying speak up. And I and the book asks people to find the space where they're most comfortable and just step out in faith to understand that if we can see ourselves, each of us as a trans transformational agent. We ourselves are contributing to the problem. So we ourselves can contribute to the change in whatever ways we can. And that's what I am trying to do because now I do recycle. I mean, I'm very conscientious about recycling. Um, I have four different, you know, containers in my kitchen that I drop things in. So it's easier to just take one paper bag and put in the blue b- b- box and want to put in, the, you know, the other box for buckles and all that stuff. And it, yes, it took me time to find a nice, cute container so my kitchen wouldn't look junky. But I found <laughs> Those are important things. <laughs> because because so some of us, our senses have to be, you know, in tune with these things. So, you know, I'm going to put a boob in my bag. Right? So find a nice basket or bin that is pretty to you and you put it in there and then you just move it when it's time to go to the blue bin. So find a place where you can enter and ask how and when and where can I enter? I have this concern. I have this fear that my children or my grandchildren, if you don't have any children of your own, there's this idea in, um, in Native American philosophy is that we want to be good ancestors, right? We want to be seen as when we pass on, and I might add that many people in the transhumanist movement don't really want to pass on too soon, but when we, they want to live until 150 and 200 years. But if we allow ourselves to pass on after, let's say, 100 years is a good enough time to live, we pass on and leave something behind, we'll be seen as good ancestors. So Miss Sundberg and her crew don't have to come thundering at us like, you guys are the pit. You know, you have messed up the world for us. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, there's a lot of millennials right now and Gen Zs that are really concerned about the status of the planet. And, I mean, you know, their population, uh, de- you know, their population percentage in the world today is is increasing, uh, you know, day by day. It's, it's it's you know, it's what, 30, 40 percent of the, the country of the world now population is in that millennial or Gen Z zone. They're going to have a major voice and and what things, how we do, you know, and make policy changes in society. So they're, they're, I hope, 
I hope, and I say I hope because unfortunately, I think COVID may have slowed down some of those movements because they couldn't gather anymore. And mm. for countries where they like to repress people, right? Mm -hmm. They have been using that to repress these movements. So we have to, again, those of us who have a little more freedom to move and freedom to organize, have to find ways of supporting these young people who are carrying the torch for us. Um, you know, So the Sean Graves of this world, the Clarence of this world, we have to find these young people who we can mentor and support. Yeah started their own uh, podcast okay can we be on their podcast can they be on our podcast can we exchange that's right so we can move forward because quite frankly they have the energy to go 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 we're more like oh gosh it's two o'clock i've got to go to my bed <laughs> <laughs> we wear out a little earlier than them at this stage in our life <laughs> well unfortunately i'm still going to bed at two o'clock i'm trying to get to 12 o'clock that's my <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, okay. So for the listeners, um, Claire, how do we get, how do they get your book? How do we get your book? Well, the book is on Amazon, Smart Futures for a Flourishing World. As I said, it's part of a series, Resetting, in our, resetting our Futures. Um, and you heard about the stories. I just want to say a little bit about, more about that. So what I did was um, in Futures Thinking, we have this idea of describing the world in layers and that the world begins with, a, with the base of the mythology that drives us, right? We all are born into a particular mythological system, um, whether it's based on Hindu philosophy, Christian philosophy, whatever. Uh, but that philosophy still is a part of a global mythology. So I did something quite crazy. I decided to have, uh, think of COVID as an opportunity that the gods that created us, there are many creator gods in many cultures. So I had the creator gods of, many cultures, if not all cultures, come together in a convocation to start the book. And I say, they've come together to say, basically, we're going to put a pause on these humans. They're getting on really crazy down there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually, you know, kind of, I didn't plan on doing it when I started writing the book. This came after I started the book, when I realized that I didn't have that causality that helped me to make sense of why I thought the COVID pandemic period was such an important transition for humanity, because it was like a wake up call to so many people mm -hmm. that we had to move faster, we had to work harder, we had to work differently, we had to form new alliances, new partnerships. And so the beauty of COVID for me, and so the book starts with this and it ends with the story as well. And we talk about Anansi as the storyteller, which has traversed from Africa, to the Caribbean and to the Americas, and Nancy being a collector of these stories of hope. And I start at the year 3000 and I end in the year 2030 because 2030 is where we have all agreed that we're saying we want the world to look like this. And therefore, I figure since we at least have some agreement, let me end with that as the nearest future to which we might aspire. And 3,000 I picked because I wanted something outside of our lifespan, but again, recognizing that our mythology, the stories that will be told of us could either be like, well, back in the, in the 21st century, when humanity was still pretty young, you know, they had a major plague. It was called the COVID pandemic. And in that time, there were lots of wars and petty fights about this and they weren't getting along. But some people woke up and found a way to patch up their quarrels enough that they could save themselves from self-extinction. That's kind of what I want a story to be. I don't want in here 4,000 to hear, you know, humans are walking around, I'm gonna see something like the Matrix wearing some tube somewhere. And then <laughs> it's all, yeah, it's all a, a bit, you know, I don't want virtual that. world, right? We don't want that. We want a real world, not a virtual world. Right. But nobody has written a movie to counteract the effects of the matrix. So I believe the power of story is so much that we're hurtling closer to matrix than we are towards the Star Trek fantasy. Yeah. And yeah. As a Trekkie, I would like us to move towards the Star Trek fantasy. So I have 3000 where we are now a star, star going species. And we have human outposts on the world and we have actually come to achieve peace on earth and goodwill to all humans. 
Well, that's that's a good story, and and I you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there with uh, the listeners today. This has been a fantastic interview. Uh, you know, it's been exciting. The book is really good, and I you know I spent a lot of time reading the book, and the storytelling that came with it uh, really added to the um, you know the uh, importance of understanding. Hey, that we're in a fight for our lives in a sense here. We need to get this thing right. We want to leave a better world behind for our future and our generation. So Claire, thanks for coming on the show today. It was great. And we're going to promote the book. We'll get it out there. I've got links on the website for everybody to get it to, uh, to go, you know, to buy it. And um, thanks for coming on the show today. And thanks for having me. I truly enjoyed your stretching my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Uh,